Well, if that last song, is that it? If that last song didn't get you excited, I don't know what will. I love that song, Worthy is the Lamb, because that is the song that we're going to be singing for all eternity. If you don't like that song, you're going to be bored in heaven. Uh, Revelation chapter 7 gives us a picture. John uh, saw those from every tribe and tongue and nation gathered together there in heaven. They were all falling before the throne of the Lamb and singing praises to the Lamb. There's a lot of hymns that you can like and call your favorite, but I hope you love that one that says, Worthy is the Lamb. Jesus Christ, because of His atoning death on the cross, because He died for our sins and was buried and rose from the dead and is coming again, He is worthy of all of our praise in adoration. And you can, you can raise your hands to the Lord. We're not against that here, you know. You can be a, a touchdown Jesus kind of person. Uh, you can be a T-Rex Jesus kind of person. We, we don't care. You can raise one hand if you're not comfortable with two. But I'll tell you what, singing praise to the Lord with that song, what a, what a great way to lead into our worship this morning. I'm going to ask, as you're turning to 2 Samuel chapter 12 this morning, while I've got you turning to that passage, Brother Darrell's going to come, and he wants to share something real quickly before we get into this morning's message. Go ahead, Darrell. Uh, give a big thanks to a lot of our members from our church came yesterday and had a work day and um, we had crews in here working working on the woodwork uh, the carpet uh, had some guys shampooing carpets in the Sunday school rooms we painted out in the welcome area in the kitchen in the hallway memorial hall um, had a great crew uh, larger than I thought would show up and I was super super blessed and you know this is our house this is God's house this is our church and we take care of it um, it's a big church big crew good godly people here um i just want to this a big thank you for everybody i want everybody to know that yeah uh, raise, raise your hand if you were here yesterday working sarcioni you got pizzas for us that doesn't count <laughs> no i'm just kidding he, he did help us a lot raise your hand if you were here working yesterday and there were a lot in the early service i'd say we had at least 50 maybe 60 Gosh, people they just working up, so and they just great. kept showing up even bob atha he was out there sleeping on the curb all afternoon. <laughs> and no, he painted all that yellow uh, curbage, curbage that you see outside that's bright yellow. He did a great job. And, and great day. We all worked together and we had a good time. People get to know one another better when they serve like that. You get to spend time with people that you don't normally spend time with. It was great to see some of our older Christians together side by side with our teenagers and younger Christians. And that's the way it should be in the church working together and serving the Lord. So thank you to all of you who showed up yesterday for that. Now, turning our attention to God's Word this morning in 2 Samuel chapter 12, I want to begin reading in verse 1 and read down through verse 14. And the Lord sent Nathan to David, he came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. And he brought it up. And it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. Now, there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled. You see in verse 5, David interrupts the sermon of Nathan the prophet. His anger was greatly kindled against this man in the story, this rich man, this, this thief, this greedy man who stole the sheep from the poor man. And David in his rage says to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb 
fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Underline those words. This was the prophet saying, David, you're that man in the story. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah and if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord? to do what is evil in his sight. You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You've taken his wife to be your wife. You've killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For what you did, you did secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned. I have sinned. Against the Lord, it says. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. And then Nathan went away to his house. Father, these are heavy and hard words. But would you impress upon us this morning the destructive nature of sin, how it ruins and ravages lives, but how you offer your forgiveness and your mercy and your grace to those who will turn from it. May we learn today to be seekers of your heart, God, as we seek out forgiveness for our sins in our lives. This will bring revival to us individually, to our homes, and to our church. So I pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. From the files of the not-so-intelligent, the how ridiculous can people be, I found this news story. I actually printed it off so that you would know. I'm not making this up. I couldn't make this up. It's too bizarre. But it is the news story from February of 2015, cbsla.com, in Costa Mesa, California. It is the news story of a woman and her husband who were driving along in their automobile, their car, and they had their dog with them in the car, and it was a pit bull. And, and their dog started attacking them. Do we, do we have a picture of that rabid dog here on the screen? Yeah, that's it. That looks, more like, that looks more like Flash from the Dukes of Hazzard, doesn't it? Um, so that's not really the rabid dog. But in this story, it was a real dog in the car with them, attacking them, biting them, tearing them apart. They pull over into a parking lot and kick the dog out of the car. Actually, the story goes that the husband got out and the dog chased him out into the parking lot. But then, fearing for the dog's safety, they invited him back into the car. Do you want to guess what happened when the rabid pit bull that had bit them inside the car and then left the car, do you want to guess what happened when he got back in the car? You can't fix stupid, right? I mean, at this point, the dog attacks them again and bites them again. And the story goes on to say that it took the arrival of police and fire uh, to take the dog away. I, I did read in another telling of this story that the family would not give permission even for the dog to be put down. Apparently, they wanted it back in their home. I don't understand that level of foolishness. I can't imagine myself being that foolish to want to bring back into my car or into my home a dog that had bitten me and attacked me and threatened my life and the life of my family. 
But each and every one of us do the exact same thing every day when it comes to the treatment of sin in our lives. It's because we don't see sin as such a big threat that we invite sin or, or maybe some pet sin to, to come into our lives and, and it ravages our lives and it wreaks havoc upon us and upon our marriages and upon our families and upon our homes and upon our churches. And about the time that we think it's dealt with, what do we foolishly do? We open up the door and invite it back into our lives. We're creatures of habit. We invite sin back in time and time again, knowing the destruction that it causes, the chaos that it brings. And oftentimes we wonder why it is that it doesn't seem like God is blessing my marriage or my home or, or why God's not blessing me personally. When the answer lies in front of us all along, it's sin. It's sin that we often willfully embrace and invite into our lives. I want you to see this morning from this account, from what's taking place in David's life, just how serious sin is in the life of a child of God. I want you to see the destruction it causes and particularly notice three things over the next two weeks because this is going to be a two-part message. We're going to start today, we're going to wrap it up next week and, and give some more flesh to it. I, I realized in the early service today I couldn't get through all of this, so I'm not going to make you sit through an hour and 15 minute sermon, we'll just divide it up. But I want you to notice these three things over the next two weeks. Number one, when we choose sin over righteousness, the sin that we choose will ruin our lives. It's a simple point. When we choose sin over righteousness, the sin that we choose will ruin our lives. And before I go on, I probably need to at least pause momentarily and define what sin is. It's sad that I have to do that, but we live in a culture today that says there's no such thing as sin, right? I mean, basically, if you look at the world around us, sin has just been reduced to an individual's choice. We're not allowed to call anything sin. God forbid, it's always followed up with, well, you can't judge anyone. You can't judge. You can't judge. You can't judge me. Nobody can judge me. We say that over and over again as if it is wrong to speak the truth about what is sin. It's, it's not wrong. Sin is a violation of God's standard. You see, God by his very essence is perfect. We, we use the term holiness to describe the nature of God. He is apart from and separate from any kind of unrighteousness or wrongdoing. He is perfect. And it is God, the creator, who sets the standard for what is right and for what is perfect. We don't create that in and of ourselves. No, no local judge or magistrate or city council or city authorities or, 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 or Supreme Court or... or, or Congress, they, they don't establish what's right or what's wrong. In fact, sometimes they miss the mark. It is God who says, this is right, this is true, this is holy, and we subject ourselves to what God says is true. But when we go against God's perfect standard, when we rebel against what God has said is right, we sin. And it's not only in our actions. Let me point this out because some people miss this. It's not just what we do. Do you remember Jesus drove this point home in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 22 and 28 specifically. He deals with the issues of lust and anger. And he drives home this point that sin is not only what we do, but it's also the attitude and intent of our hearts. So Jesus says, it's not enough to say, I've kept the law by not murdering my neighbor, okay? Imagine this scenario. You're really upset. You're really ticked off at a co-worker for doing something wrong, and you're saying to yourself, boy, I could just throttle that guy today. I could just choke him, or I could just uh, beat her with a club for doing that. But then you say, at least I didn't do it, so I'm okay. I didn't act upon that impulse, so I'm okay. Jesus comes along and speaks to that very scenario and says, no, if you are harboring hatred in your heart towards that person, even if you don't act on it, then you have sinned. You say, wait a minute, why is that? I didn't act on it. Here's why. Because God didn't create you to harbor hatred towards your neighbor. 
He created us in his perfect will and in his perfect plan to what? Love our neighbor as ourselves. That's why the whole summation of the law is to love God with all our heart, soul, might, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. If you hate your neighbor, even if you never act on it, you're not loving your neighbor the way God created you to. He uses the other analogy of lust. Husbands, how many of you think that your wives would be satisfied if you told them, well, honey, I look at a lot of women and I think a lot of impure thoughts, but I never act upon them. I don't think any of our wives would be satisfied with that. So why would we think God would be happy with that? See, it's not enough that we don't act upon lustful impulses. Jesus says, if you are looking upon a woman, he's not just talking about a glance. He's talking here about the thoughts, the impulses, the intent of the heart. When you're gazing upon that image, when you're looking at someone else's wife and thinking impure thoughts, Jesus says, even if you don't act on it, you've committed adultery in your heart. Jesus makes the point that sin is not just what we do. It is the condition of our hearts. It's often manifested in what we say. It's often manifested in the attitudes that we have towards others. And the Bible makes very clear that every individual born of Adam has sinned and does sin. Has sinned and does sin. And I'll address that more in a few moments. But my point is, I'm not here this morning wagging my finger and saying, you, you, you are a sinner. The Bible teaches very clearly that we, 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 all of us are sinners. So I go back to that first point. When we choose sin over righteousness, that sin that we choose will ravage our lives. The second thing that we're going to see in this survey of, of this account of David's life is that God holds us personally accountable for our sin. He does. We're going to see that with David's example. God holds David accountable for the choices that he made and the sin that he chose. And points one and two don't sound like good news, right? We're sinners that choose sin and God holds us accountable and we think, oh, so what hope is there for me? Well, there's the third point, the good news. The good news of grace is that God forgives and restores broken, messed up sinners just like David, just like you, just like me. That's the grace. That's the good news. Yes, we're broken. Yes, sin will ravage and destroy our lives. Yes, God holds us accountable for it. But as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 5, where sin does abound, grace doth much more abound. Where sin is present, there is also much more grace to cover that sin. And we see the grace of God even in this account of David's life. This is now the fourth message in our series, Seeking After the Heart of God. And what I want you to see is that you can become someone who seeks and pursues the heart of God by exercising and practicing the confession of sin in your own life daily. In fact, I would argue that this is what keeps many people from seeking the heart of God, is that they don't know how to rightly and biblically confront and deal with sin. Now, we left David last week in the valley, standing over the body of a defeated giant, Goliath. And as this series of messages is not an in-depth survey of every aspect of David's life, it's sort of a flyover of some key events, a lot transpired between the text that we read in 2 Samuel 12 and the slaying of Goliath. So let me catch you up on what's happened in David's life between the death of Goliath and the con confrontation of Nathan the prophet. After David killed Goliath, he became instantly an overnight hero, like a superhero status in Israel, okay? Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18 tells us that the people of Israel would sing songs about David and his heroism and his acts of bravery. They would line the streets and sing a song that sounded like this. David has, uh, I'm sorry, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. Saul, you're okay, but David, you're great. Saul's done this, but David's done this. There's a little tension that's created between the current king sitting on the throne, Saul, and the young boy who's already been anointed by the prophet David. Keep in mind, by this point, David is also now married to Saul's daughter, right? 
The king said, whoever steps out and slays this giant will receive as his reward my daughter. So David's got some tension, like many of us do, with his in-laws. It gets so tense, though, that his father-in-law wants to kill him. Hopefully your tension with your mother-in-law or father-in-law hasn't got that bad, right? Saul wants to kill David. He feels threatened by David's presence. He feels threatened by the fact that Israel has accepted David with greater reverence than they have Saul. And so there are accounts in the latter part of 1 Samuel of the numerous times that Saul tries to take David's life. He tries to kill him. He threatens him. He tells him, if I see your face again, I'm going to kill you. And David, as he frequently does, acts righteously and justly even in the face of opposition. He chooses not to take revenge on Saul, even though he could have. On at least two occasions, he got close enough that he was able to snip a part of Saul's garment. And he tells Saul, I could have killed you. I could have taken your head. I could have elevated myself to the throne. But David didn't want to do that. He believed in God. He trusted God. And he believed that God in his time would deal with Saul and elevate David on God's own terms. And so David patiently waits. When you come to the end of 1 Samuel chapter 31, Saul is eventually killed in battle. And the nation mourns, but David then ascends to the throne. And in the early chapters of 2 Samuel, you read the account of David's leadership through his military genius, through his strategic diplomacy, Israel under David becomes the strongest nation in the world in its day. They enlarge their borders. They conquer their enemies. This is the high watermark of Israel's poetic and artistic achievement. All the nations wanted to be like Israel. They all wanted to be blessed the way Israel was. It seemed that David had everything that he could have wanted as a seeker of God's heart. He had been blessed, he had been elevated, he had been exalted. But even, listen, even in his blessed state, he could not escape the temptations of his heart. And so you come to 2 Samuel chapter 11, and you can read the account, maybe you'll do this later today in your quiet time, of David, as his men go out to battle, he stays behind. Rather than being with his men in the fight, he stays behind, perhaps by himself, and he wanders up onto the rooftop of his house one evening. Maybe he was there praying. Maybe he was there to look at the stars and and glorify God. But his evening was interrupted when he looks over and sees on an adjacent rooftop a beautiful woman, unclothed, bathing. He should have turned his head. He should have walked away. But instead, he begins to leer at the naked woman. He begins to lust after her. And he sends his servants, go get her and bring her to me. And they do. And David commits a gross, sinful act with Bathsheba. And then he sets about to cover up his evil deeds. And if you know the story from 2 Samuel chapter 11... In the wake of his lust, David pondered, how can I clean up this mess? How can I deal with this situation? So he sets about trying to cover up and hide his sin. He tries bringing home Bathsheba's husband, a man named Uriah. And Uriah was a seasoned warrior. He was a loyal leader in David's army. He was well respected among his men. And David brings home Uriah and says, "Uh, Uriah, you need to come and spend some time with your wife. He was hoping that Uriah and Bathsheba would get together and conceive, and then David felt like his trail would be covered up. He tries getting Uriah drunk. He tries getting Uriah, anything he can do to get Uriah in there with his wife, but Uriah won't have it. He says, no, my men are in the field. I need to be back there with my men. And so David, making matters worse, cooks up a plan, and you read about this in the very last part of chapter 11, whereby he sends a messenger to tell the commander of the forces of his army, get Uriah out there in the front, the heat of the battle, the thickest part of the battle. And when Uriah is engaged in combat, and when the odds look overwhelming, then pull all the men back. You see what he was doing? 
He was signing Uriah's death warrant, wasn't he? And God acknowledges this. We read it just a few moments ago in chapter 12. God holds David responsible for the murder of Uriah and says as much when he says, you're the one that killed Uriah the Hittite. Even if you used the hand or the sword of the Ammonites, David, it was you trying to cover up your sin that murdered this innocent God's anointed, who had been on the mountaintop, now finds himself deep in a valley of despair. Write down at least two things to learn in this early part of this account. Number one, and please take note of this, none of us are ever, ever beyond sin's reach. None of us, humanly speaking, are ever beyond sin's grasp. Only the Lord Jesus Christ Himself withstood the temptation of the enemy. Only Jesus Christ Himself, empowered by the Holy Spirit and living in full and complete obedience to God the Father, withstood the temptations of Satan. The book of Hebrews tells us He was tempted in all points like as we, and yet without sin. But every one of us, every child that is born of the seed of Adam, we are always potentially one bad decision away from the destructiveness of sin wrecking and ruining our lives. Don't miss this. There's no such thing as sinless perfection. And I would get as far away if I heard somebody telling you, hey man, I've never sinned, I don't sin, I never think, I'd get as far away from that teaching as I could because it's rubbish. It's not biblical. The Bible makes very clear that great men of God, like Moses, sinned. Great men of God, like David, sinned. Even in their redeemed state. Great men of God, like even the Apostle Paul, wrestled with and continued to fall short when it came to sin until the end of his life. Paul recounts this in Romans chapter 7 when he talks about the nature of the struggle between the spirit and the flesh. And Paul says, oh, daily, I, I do things that I, that I don't want to do and I find myself not doing the things that I do want to do. He was acknowledging this this bondage to the flesh. And as long as you and I are in these sinful bodies, we continue to struggle with sin. None of us are beyond its reach. We all await that day when in the future resurrection we will be given new bodies. Read 1 Corinthians 15 that are free from the tarnishment of sin, that are untouched and unblemished by sin. But that's our resurrection hope. As long as we live in this body and in this life, we struggle with sin. Don't ever think you're above it. And don't ever think you are above those who have sinned. Because we are neither. We are neither above sin, nor are we any better than or above those who have given in to it. We are all in the reach of sin and its havoc. The second thing that you see right away is that even though someone like David yielded to sin, gave into it, invited its destructiveness into his home, God was eager to restore David and to forgive him and to cover his sin, to atone for his sin and to invite him back into fellowship with himself. This is why I read those powerful words from 1 John chapter 1 earlier. God invites us back into fellowship with him, even when we have failed him and sinned, even when we've invited the dog back into the car, even when it's begun to chew us up and spit us out and ravage us once again, God stands eager to welcome us back into fellowship with himself. That's grace. That's grace. That is mercy. Right? That is unmerited favor. What kind of God is this? Who even in our sin opens his arms and says, Turn from that sin, be cleansed by the blood of my son, and draw near to me again. That is mercy undefinable. 
and we see it exemplified in David's life. Let me point out this one thing before I conclude this morning. The first step in the process that I'll flesh out more next week, the process of restoration is this, that restoration begins. Restoration from the destructiveness of sin begins when you realize the seriousness of sin. When you realize that sin is serious and it is not something that we can just cover up or gloss over. David tried to do this. He really tried hard to do what many of us try to do. He tried to hide his sin, not only from his fellow man, but also from God. Don't feel bad if you've done that. Or if you're doing, well, you should feel bad. Let me rephrase that. Don't feel like you're alone if you've done that. All of us have done it. In fact, our attempts to cover up and hide and conceal our sin from God go all the way back to the beginning of time. Remember Adam and Eve? Y'all remember that story? When God came into the garden and confronted Adam about his sin. What was his immediate response? I love this. Husbands have been doing it ever since. Blame his wife. It was that woman you gave me, Lord. She did it. Wasn't me. He didn't want to own his sin. He didn't want to accept responsibility for what he does. He points the finger at his wife and says, it's her. Uh, do, do you remember later in Israel's history, there's a man named Achan in the book of Joshua? And in the midst of Israel going into the promised land and defeating their enemies and, and, and inheriting the land that God gave them, you've got this one knucklehead, Achan, who goes out into the battle and does what God said don't do. God said, don't plunder the enemy. Don't keep any gold for yourself. Don't do that. Achan says, well, this, you know, God won't know if just one of us does it. So he takes plunder from the battle and he brings it back and he buries it under his tent. And then Israel starts getting whipped in every battle they go into. They start getting defeated. And all the people around Achan begin to suffer the consequences of his hidden sin. That's because his sin was never hidden from God. And God exposed Achan. We could go on and on. Ananias and Sapphira. You want a New Testament example? Ananias and Sapphira. They thought they could fool God. And that story is amazing on so many levels in Acts chapter 5. Because God, I, I, I believe, and this is theoretical, I believe God would have been satisfied with whatever they chose to give. God didn't say they had to give everything, but what they did was they lied to the Holy Spirit. They said they gave everything, when in reality they held some back for themselves. They wanted the praise and applause of men, and they lied in their pride. And the Holy Spirit judged them quickly and harshly for trying to cover up and hide their sin. What are you trying to hide from God today? He knows about it. What measures are you going to to try to cover up your sin? Are you trying to justify it by saying, well, you know, everybody else is doing it? How many co-workers have you heard say, well, you know, I, I know it's dishonest, but, you know, everybody does it around here. Everybody steals supplies around here. It's not like it's a big deal. Everybody punches someone else's time card when they're late. We do that all the time. It's no big. We, we try to justify our sin. We try to hide it and conceal it. We think by hiding it from men that we are hiding it from God. And, and, and what we're really seeking to do is to hold or conceal or keep to ourselves some little sin that we think we can hide from God. And we become like children trying to keep a pet cobra. It will eventually grow up and it will bite you and it will poison you and it will kill you. We become like the family in the Indian parable that is Asian Indian, not North American Indian, who took a small tiger cub into their hut and the tiger was so cute when it was small and it was so furry and it was so cuddly and the kids loved to play with it but eventually the tiger grew up and devoured the children. 
We become like that when we cover up and conceal our sin. But notice this, God will always, for his glory and for our good, God will always bring our sin out into the open so that it can be confronted. In this story, it was Nathan, the prophet. And we don't hear much about Nathan in the Old Testament, but his role is critical. Because he had the job of confronting the most popular king of Israel about his hidden sin. Can you imagine being in Nathan's shoes when God spoke to you and said, I want you to go talk to David. You're going to hold him accountable. You're going to call him out for some things that he's hidden from Israel. And so Nathan goes and he tells this story. It's a parable, really. It's a story that he uses to illustrate and drive home a point. A rich man who has everything has company one weekend and decides he's not going to kill one of his own. He's going to go over here and steal the one beloved lamb that belongs to this poor family. And when David hears this story being told, his anger wells up within him. As we said earlier in verse 5, he is so angry that he takes the Lord's name. So he, he swears this oath by the Lord's name as the Lord lives. He says, this guy deserves to die. So even though David was concealing his own sin, he retained a sense of justice and righteousness and an understanding of consequences. Only David was quick to go over the top in his judgment of this man in the parable. I mean, stealing a lamb, it's a bad thing, but you don't deserve to die for stealing another man's lamb, not according to the law. But David was ready to have this man killed, and then he tacks on to the death sentence a fourfold repayment. David's conscience wasn't seared. Yes, he was concealing his own sin, but he still understood that God is just, that there was right, that there was wrong, that there were consequences for actions. And then in verse 7, Nathan turns it all around on him. God turns the tables through the prophet, and that prophet points his finger at David and says, you don't get it. There is no man. There is no lamb. That guy in the story is you, David. David is broken. In verse 13, the only words that he can utter, I have sinned. I have sinned. And you can insert a little note in your Bible, or there may already be one there. This was the event that led to David pinning the 51st Psalm. It was this confrontation. See, God had to use a prophet to confront David. He had to use a sermon to get to David's heart. He had to use a story to get David's attention. I don't know what God has to use to get your attention, to bring about the kind of conviction that leads to brokenness, that leads to a turning back to God. But whatever God has to do to get your attention, He will do it to bring you to the point of conviction that you might turn from your sin. As I'll flesh out a little bit more next week, David had to face his own sinfulness, and so must we, to be brought to a point where David had to confess and repent of his sin in verse 13. And he's still going to have to deal with consequences. I'm going to talk about that next week. But the beauty and the glory of this passage is in those few words that we read at the end of verse 13. And I want to wrap it up with this. Even though David had sinned, even though David was broken, the prophet speaks to David and says, Yahweh, the Lord, he has put away your sin. Now listen, this is not God turning a blind eye to sin. This is not God sort of, you know, poo-pooing and saying, oh, it doesn't matter, it wasn't that big a deal. It's not that at all. 
This is God acting according to his justice in the life of one of his own for whom atonement had been made. David had been declared righteous in the sight of God. He belonged to God through a covenant relationship. And as gross as his sin was, he is reminded by the words of the prophet here that God does not cast us off or throw us out or put us aside when we have sinned against him. He offers reconciliation and atonement and covering. And even though, according to the Levitical law, David was due a death sentence. Do you see that? Verse 13. God was merciful to him. Atonement was made. Reconciliation was offered. I ask you this morning to ponder these questions because we're going to come back and finish this out next week. But I, I want you to ponder these questions today and throughout this week and be honest with God because He already knows the answers. Uh, number one, are there sins in your life that you need to deal with? Are there sins in your life that you need to deal with, that you are covering up and hiding, that you think nobody knows about, that are keeping you from God, maybe in salvation? You may not be saved today because of this sin that stands between you and God. But you might be a Christian that hasn't grown in years or decades because you can't deal honestly with your sin. Number two, I want you to ponder the question of what will it take for you to deal with sin honestly and to come to terms with it. For David, it was the humiliation of being confronted openly and publicly by, in this case, Nathan the prophet. I don't know what it will take to bring conviction into your life, but I know that God loves you enough that he will go to whatever lengths he needs to to capture your heart with truth, to convict you of sin, to draw you to the cross. What is it going to take? And thirdly, when are you going to be honest about your sin and turn to God and just allow Him to embrace you to cover your sin with the sacrificial death of His Son? What's keeping you today from turning from your sin and embracing Christ as Lord? What's keeping you today from putting away that thing that you know is wreaking havoc on your life, but you just, like that woman, keep bringing it back in and bringing it back in and then complaining about the scars. What's it going to take? What's it going to take? Father, by your grace and by the power of your spirit, do your work of conviction this morning. Speak to every one of us. As you've already spoken to me, I, I pray that you'll speak to every one of us here about how serious you are concerning sin, but how wonderful and abundant your grace is as well. Lord, I don't want anyone to leave here today distraught and discouraged and disheartened. I want them to leave full of hope and full of joy, knowing that they can be reconciled to you through the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son. So speak to us now, and if one needs to come for salvation, or another may need to come and simply profess salvation, others may want to come and in the quietness of their own hearts pray and make things right with you. Well, just speak to us, Lord, and do that during this time of invitation. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.